We've got an updated perspective on the violence in Iraq from a former Marine who fought there. Does the U.S. have any good options in the crisis? Plus, the latest on the problems within the Veterans Administration then, the right to keep and bear arms. It's at the heart of one of the most controversial parts of the U.S. Constitution and a red-hot topic in American politics. Michael Waldman, attorney, former speechwriter for President Clinton, delivers a biography of the Second Amendment. It's all next on Politicking. We'll talk about a fascinating new book on the Second Amendment later in the show, but first, We'll focus on what's happening in Iraq and the latest on the scandal within the Veterans Administration. Joining me to talk about this is Dan Caldwell, a former active duty Marine who served in Operation Iraq Freedom. He is currently the Issues and Legislative Campaign Manager for Concerned Veterans of America. He joins us from Washington. Dan, we'll talk about the Veterans Administration in a moment, but what's your read on what's going on in Iraq? Well, it's an unfortunate situation, and I think it's a result of a very schizophrenic foreign policy in the Middle East that we've seen during this current administration. There's been varying degrees of focus on Iraq and on the Middle East in general, and there's been a really incomplete policy. Uh, one minute we're drawing red lines, the other minute we're talking about leading from behind, we're being very aggressive in things like don drone strikes, uh, going after al-Qaeda, but then the next we're pulling back. Um, this is really a result, I think, of this current administration not paying the proper attention to the growth of this group in the Middle East and what has been going on in Iraq and other countries uh, for a while now. So what should we do, in your opinion, now? Well, there's a couple different things, and I want to rank them in order of priority. The first priority is to ensure the safety of the thousands of Americans that are working and living in Iraq. Uh, they're there at the behest of our government. They work for the State Department. There's a few military personnel there, Marines like myself at the embassy, uh, various different contractors, security, people there to help Iraq. We need to make sure they're safe. We need to make sure that they have a proper evacuation plan in place that can be executed on either by the military or by private contractors. Uh, and then the next priority is to really make sure that we start to contain and roll back ISIS. Um, right now, ISIS just took control of the, the Iraq's largest oil refinery. That's very disturbing. Uh, they can seriously damage Iraq's economy. And in my mind, what is even worse is, is that they're very close to seizing the Haditha Dam in western Iraq. If ISIS gains control of that facility, they could flood a large portion of the country and cut off about a third of the electrical power in Iraq. That could create a huge humanitarian crisis. I believe that the United States military needs to look at options to ensure the safety of that dam up to including seizing it like mm -hmm. we did in 2003 uh, with the Ranger Regiment and uh, other special operations forces. The uh, New York Times polled CBS News, eight, only 18 percent of Americans think this whole Iraqi war was worth the cost in blood and in treasure. What are your thoughts on that? I will say that we don't know at this point if this war is worth it. And quite frankly, I, I, I don't think there's really a point in arguing that at, the, at this point. It doesn't matter what decisions we made in 2003 or in 2007 with the surge. The fact of the matter is, is that an extremely violent, anti-American, anti-Western terrorist organization has seized large swaths of land in Iraq and Syria. They could use that area to create a sanctuary where they can train more jihadist fighters, more terrorists, just like the ones that attacked us on 9-11. They could use that area to rebuild Al-Qaeda, which has been seriously degraded over the years, um, at least the central Al-Qaeda, other branches have grown out like ISIS. Uh, and we could start to see more attacks in the West and unfortunately in the United States. Um, you know, the facts right now are, are that the Middle East is teetering on the edge. It's teetering on the edge of anarchy. And if they fall into complete chaos, not just in Iraq and Syria, but it spreads to places like Jordan, Saudi Arabia, it could have serious consequences for not just that region, but the whole economy in the United States in, in general as well. So it is our business. I, I do believe it is. I'm not 
somebody who believes that we should be policing the world. I consider myself a realist. And looking at, at this situation, I see real threats to American interests and ultimately the American homeland. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe uh, in doing things like arming the Syrian rebels or I, I didn't agree with, with some of the things we did in Libya. Um, but we need to take a look at this situation and realize that there is real threats to American interests around the world and ultimately probably to the American homeland in general. Well said. Now on the issue at hand. On Monday, an independent federal investigator reported uh, that the Department of Veterans Affairs has put patients at risk by overlooking reports from whistleblowers who detail many problems with the patient. What's wrong with the VA? Well, there's a couple things wrong with the VA. The first is really a cultural issue and the administrative management side of the VA. Uh, there is an unaccountable management culture at the VA. And what I mean by that is, is that the people running the VA at, at the top levels and at the middle levels believe they can do whatever they want. There's no consequences for their action. They don't have to respond to Congress, veterans groups, the American people. They basically believe they're above the law. And that ultimately is the biggest problem with the VA is its culture. I also think how they deliver health care and other benefits is inefficient. The, the single payer model they use, I think, is, is ineffective, and I think that's been proven so. Um, and I also think that because they've just been consistently given a blank check by Congress for really the last 10 years, that they think that, okay, you know, we're going to keep getting more money. We don't need to worry about being efficient. We don't need to worry about delivering care in a more efficient and timely manner. And then, you know, at the end of the day, the, you know, closing the loop on that, it doesn't really matter because either way, they're going to get a, a good performance review. They're going to get a bonus. There's no really consequences if they ultimately fail at their job. What, what the concerned veterans would do what to fix this? An overhaul? Well, what do you do? Start from the beginning? Well, there needs to be a serious overhaul. First of all, you need to do some things, pass some legislation to help uh, with the VA's unaccountable culture. Uh, we, for a long time, have been pushing a bill called the VA Accountability Management Act. It makes it easier to fire some of these poorly performing senior managers. It looks like that that act is going to be part of this bipartisan package, so that's good. Uh, then ultimately, I think you're going to have to change the way VA delivers health care. We, we believe, and why we've been so, so supportive of things like the Veteran Choice Act, um, that it's more efficient to give veterans more health care options in the private sector aside from the VA's uh, ineffective single-payer system. Uh, and then also really getting in a, a new leadership team there. There's a lot of vacant uh, positions at the top of the VA and across the, the VA, I, I hope that President Obama makes it a top priority to fill those positions now uh, rather than later. Is that legislation going to pass soon? Well, right now there's a conference committee to uh, between the House and Senate to work out the differences between the, the House and Senate bill. Uh, it is our hope that there are some issues resolved, particularly with the Senate side of the legislation. Um, in the conference committee, particularly related to spending, uh, tightening up some of the requirements for for uh, veterans who want to use health uh, different health care options in the private sector, and then some of this other superfluous stuff within the legislation, we'd like to be see either stripped out or or watered down. If something else comes out of conference committee, the spending isn't controlled. Then, unfortunately, I don't think our group would view that as a win for veterans, and probably wouldn't support that piece of legislation. Nan, thank you so much for your time and your service. Continued great work. Thank you. Keep up. We'll be right back. Don't go away. And now joining me is the author Michael Waldman. His new book is entitled, I have it right here, The Second Amendment, A Biography. He's also president of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. He served as director of speech writing for President Bill Clinton from 95 through 99. Michael, why do you call this book a biography? Well, it's really the story of the Second Amendment and the story of how it's changed, how it's evolved, how the way we look at it has evolved. You know, we talk about uh, the Constitution, but it turns out that the way we understand it at any moment is not really kind of based on a pristine text, but it's always the push and pull of political debate 
And that's even true for the controversial Second Amendment. Mostly in the last 20 to 30 years, right? For a long time, we no one paid any attention to it. People didn't pay attention to it. The Supreme Court consistently didn't rule that it recognized an individual right to gun ownership. Uh, it was never cited in cases or anything like that. We had, it, it was written into the Constitution to protect principally the 13 state militias uh, when they were worried that the new government, the central government, would be too strong and would crush those militias. And obviously, Larry, over the years, we had plenty of guns in America, but we also had plenty of gun laws and gun controls. There, there, uh, I talk in the book about the Wild West. Uh, there's a wonderful photo of Dodge City, Kansas, the great uh, western town, and it looks like a movie set. It's the main street. It's a dusty main street with saloon doors. And in the middle of the street from the 1880s is a sign. It says, Welcome to Dodge City, Firearms Prohibited. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we really didn't, we, we didn't think about the Second Amendment so much in those days. It may be the shortest amendment ever. Here's the way the whole thing reads. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. At the NRA headquarters, they leave out the first part. They only state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So this could be debated forever. The Supreme Court's been divided on it. It threw out the Washington, D.C. law. Is, was it a poorly written amendment? A, they, you know, the, the, the eloquent men who wrote We the People or the First Amendment did, did, no, did us no favors with the Second <laughs> Amendment, with all those, all those commas and clauses. And, of course, the question is, uh, you know, what does that part about the militia have to do with the part about the right to keep and bear arms? And you're right, Larry, the Supreme Court only ruled that the Second Amendment recognized an individual right to gun ownership in 2008. It was really recent. And so, uh, you know, it took many years of pushing to get that by the National Rifle Association and others to try to untangle what that amendment meant. And that, as you say, they've all, they actually have an edited version of the amendment up on their yeah. wall in their headquarters. Now, we say guns, but it doesn't say guns. It says arms. So if I were to read that, I could have an atomic bomb, couldn't I? Well, back in those days, a lot of people in the military had swords, uh, and you could have an atomic, you could potentially have a bazooka or an atomic bomb. You know, the gun rights people will say that there really can't be limits of any kind, but that's not really how the courts have ruled. It turns out that even though it, it's a right, it's seen to be a right, there are limits on that right, just as there are with, with the First Amendment or anything else. And, you know, we've now been wrestling about what that means. And, you know, if, they, if there's an assault weapon that uh, can have a, a hundred rounds of ammunition, you don't need that to protect your home, you don't need it to go hunting, is that really constitutionally protected to, ha to be able to have that? Now, Washington, D.C. passed a law, a tough law. The Supreme Court threw out that law, right? Right. And it was that's a law that basically. Now. Well, you're right. So that was a pretty l narrow law. It, it pr basically prohibited having a loaded handgun in your home. And the Supreme Court said that's the ultimate self-protection weapon, and there's a constitutional right to have that in your home, a handgun. But they have not yet ruled on whether you can carry a gun. And so now you see, for example, in a place like Texas, where there's the open carry movement, where they're walking around carrying assault weapons, bringing them into fast food restaurants <laughs> or Target stores, trying to prove that it's their Second Amendment right. I'm not entirely sure that's what James Madison had in mind. <laughs> We're talking with the author Michael Waldman. His brilliant book, The Second Amendment, a biography, is available everywhere. We'll be back right after this. back with Michael Waldman. His brilliant book, The Second Amendment, a biography, is available everywhere books are sold. All right, the NR, now the Heller case, the NRA didn't bring that, did they? No, you're right, Larry. They did not bring it. Uh, it was actually brought by a small group of libertarian lawyers who thought the NRA was too timid. The NRA actually tried to block the case because they were worried they might lose. Uh, but they had sort of prepared the ground uh, so that when the case did go up to the Supreme Court, it was a five to four ruling. 
it was Justice Antonin Scalia, in a way, it was his first really big ruling that he'd, that he'd been the lead author of. And it said that it was just following the original intent of the founding fathers. Uh, and, and uh, it, you know, there's a big debate. I don't actually think it followed that original intent, but it was a big moment at the Supreme Court for that reason alone. How come nothing ever changed? How come the NRA re remains so entrenched in Congress that they can't get, they can't override that court ruling? Well, you know, the NRA is a big group. It's got a few million members, but think about AARP or some of these other groups have many more. Uh, the NRA's strength doesn't really come from money. It comes from the intensity of NRA members who will vote for or against a candidate just based on whether they think that they're, uh, where they stand on guns and gun rights. Now, I don't, look, I don't think that the American political system needs more single interest groups, but the, there's no substitute for organizing and public argument by people who want stronger gun laws. You know, if you remember last year after the horrible, horrible massacre of those children at, at Newtown, there was legislation in front of the Senate that was bipartisan. It was called Mansion Toomey. It was just to strengthen background checks. It had the support of 90% of the public in all the polls, and it failed. Uh, even though a majority of the Senate voted for it, it was filibustered. So that was, more, that was not a matter of the Constitution. That wasn't a matter even of public opinion. That was a matter of political will, and that's ultimately what's going to have to happen. So if, if you swept the, the country with a vote, can't we, can't, couldn't we repeal the Second Amendment? Well, it's very hard, of course, to change a provision of the Constitution, and uh, I'm not sure it's really necessary, because what this, if you look at the real history of it and how it's been treated and read throughout most of the country's history, it wasn't about this unlimited right to uh, carry a gun. It was about balancing that individual right with the public good and public safety. That's what those militias were in the 1791, and so it ought to be possible to have strong gun laws and to, uh, and to have it under the Constitution. But that will take a change in the way at least some people think about what it means. By the way, and everyone should read this book, I love your history of how it all began in Concord and the beginning of things. <laughs> the late Justice, uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger, a conservative appointed by President Nixon, declared once that the idea that the Constitution guarantees an individual right to keep and bear arms is one of the greatest, greatest pieces of fraud ever perpetrated on the United States public by a special interest group. He is saying that the NRA is guilty of fraud. You know, uh, and, and what's amazing is you're right that Warren Burger was a rock-ribbed conservative. No. He was appointed by Richard Nixon, and he was reflecting when he said that in 1991 what the consensus view was. It's really a recent thing to have a change uh, of this kind in what we think this provision means. Uh, it w look, the NRA, they backed scholarship, they moved public opinion, they backed politicians who ran for office. They really reorganized themselves around the idea of the Second Amendment as being this individual gun right. Uh, and they were very successful. Uh, and people who don't like it should be thinking about how to organize and keep arguing and keep fighting over a long time just the way the NRA did. I've interviewed leaders of the NRA over the years, over many years. I've been interviewing people for 57 years. And their biggest fear, as I gather, is they think that the country's going to come and take your guns away, right? Right. They're very worried about having their guns seized. Uh, you know, the people talk about black helicopters coming in and seizing mm. guns. And, you know, look, we have three, nobody, I don't know of anybody who wants to do that and we have in this country 300 million guns, practically. Nobody's going to seize all those guns. You know, some people have said, hey, look, this Heller decision, whether you think it was right or wrong, at least it should reassure people that nobody's going to take away all their guns. Uh, that, I, don't, I, I, I think that could be its consequence, but I, I worry that it leads instead to kind of Second Amendment fundamentalism where it takes on a life of its own and, and people think that uh, the Constitution says you can't have any gun laws at all, which it definitely does not. What do you think in this book will surprise people the most? 
It's a great question. I think there are sort of surprises for liberals and surprises for conservatives. I mean, one of the surprises was for me was just how important those well-regulated militias were to the founders. That, that wasn't just throat clearing. That was a, what they were really worried about. But the militias back then, uh, you, th you mentioned Lexington and Concord and the Minutemen, they weren't like anything we have now. Every adult man, eventually every adult white man, was in the militia their whole life and they were required by law to own a gun. It, we didn't have an army, we didn't have police. That was how the country protected itself. And so it was such a different world. That to me was a surprise. Yes, there was an individual right, but it was to fulfill the duty to serve in the militia. I think another surprise is just how recent this change in constitutional doctrine has been. A lot of people are very surprised by that. And it's also kind of a surprise even after this case, the District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, that, that you mentioned, dozens of courts all over the country have been asked to strike down gun laws and they've refused. They've actually upheld the gun laws. They've said, you know what, sure, there's an individual right, but there's uh, also society so, has a right to protect itself. So those courts are disobeying the ruling of the Supreme Court? Well, they would say they're following it because uh, the Supreme Court said, yeah, it's a right, but there can be limits. They didn't really say how many limits. Uh, they, they, they would argue, and these are federal courts all over the country, that they're, they're not disobeying, but some of the uh, backers of gun rights, some of the NRA people, they've likened it, if you can believe this, to massive resistance, was, which, was, you know, hmm. which was what the South did after Brown versus Board of Education. They, they say that the, these judges are, are, uh, hmm. are in fact resisting what the Supreme Court has said, and we haven't heard from the Supreme Court yet. More with best-selling author Michael Waldman right after this. Michael, where do you think it's all going? I think that uh, unless and until the public gets angry and stays angry and stays organized, that we're going to see chipping away at, uh, at these gun, uh, gun laws with these rulings. Uh, and uh, in particular, you have seen a great loosening of the rules about carrying guns everywhere. And I, I, at the same time, I think that there are ways to fix the gun issue. You know, this year, Larry, as many people, were, more people will be killed by guns than by cars in the United States. Now, at one level, of course, that's a horrifying statistic that that more people are killed by guns. But part of it is that fewer people are dying from cars than used to be. Well, why is that? They didn't seize the cars. They didn't declare cars to be illegal. They made cars safer. They raised the drinking age. They put in airbags and, and seat belts mm. and all kinds of other things. There are ways to make guns safer so that children don't accidentally shoot each other or that criminals can't use them. Uh, they involve technology. Uh, there are all kinds of technological fixes that shouldn't be seen, I don't think, as violating the Second Amendment. Uh, and mm. I hope that we don't allow these things to be blocked. I interviewed the head of Scotland Yard once, and he could not believe, could not believe that Americans can have guns. He saw no need for people to have handguns. Well, it's, you know, we, we, um, we talk about American exceptionalism, and this is a form, I suppose, of American exceptionalism that probably a lot of Americans don't even realize we're unusual. Other countries, other industrialized countries, do not come close to having the level of gun violence and gun death that we have in the United States. Um, you know, but it's an interesting thing. Although there are more guns than ever before, there are actually fewer gun owners. Uh, people aren't hunting. Uh, there's just the, the number of people owning guns is shrinking. Uh, they're wow. buying more, more guns. But, and, and the worry I have is, you know, it's one thing to have a gun for hunting or maybe a gun to protect yourself. People are buying assault weapons. And they have this kind of fear, which I think is a paranoid fear, that the government's going to come, that there's going to be tyranny, that there's going to be civilizational breakdown. And uh, that's very hard to argue with because it's such a different worldview than I think what, you know, what most of us probably have. Are you pessimistic about it all? I am on hold as to whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic, <laughs> but I think the one, one bit of um, 
positive news, I suppose, is that you now have with Mayor Michael Bloomberg and his focus on this issue with former Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, with a number of the other groups really in this for the long haul and with financial resources, uh, you know, the politicians have a tendency, they, they bring up a gun bill and then if it fails, they, they panic and they run away. And I don't think that that's acceptable. I think that this has got to be a debate that goes on and on and on over the long term, just as it is uh, for the NRA. You know, I, I, I like, in the book, I quote Abraham Lincoln when, uh, before he was president. He was in the Lincoln-Douglas debate, and he said, with public sentiment, anything is possible. Without public sentiment, nothing is possible. Public opinion, he, he who shapes public opinion, he said, uh, is more important than a judge or a legislator because they make it possible for the judge or the legislator to rule. You've got to win in the court of public opinion before you can win so, in the court of law. So that's what the gun safety folks have to do, too. Since the public opinion is primarily against guns, I mean, most Americans would vote for strong gun laws, shouldn't a presidential candidate make this a foremost issue? Well, you know, the NRA members are so focused, they'll vote for you or against you just on this. And I, you know, I, I, far be, I don't think we need more single interest groups in the country, but I think that uh, candidates for president and other high public offices, they kind of need to show a little courage, I think, and just talk about it and not overthink it and not be afraid of it. I was, I, I noted recently that Hillary Clinton, in one of her first speeches recently, did talk a lot about guns. You know, President Obama in his first four years barely ever talked about it. I know. So maybe the, these uh, massacres that w are, are getting all, you know, we're just becoming used to these horrible school shootings and massacres. Maybe, maybe uh, some politician will, will see that there's a sort of silent majority of people who are fed up with it. Memory fails me. Did it come up in the presidential debates? I don't believe that it did. I don't believe that it did. Isn't that uh, amazing? It is amazing. And, uh, you know, it was, it was buried deep in the vault. <laughs> but these recent shootings have, have reminded us of, uh, this is the first time we've had this kind of debate on gun issues in a long time. And it's the first time since the Supreme Court said there's an individual right. So that's, one, that's a new factor that everyone has to grapple with. Thanks, Michael. Thanks so much. Good seeing you again. Same here, Larry. Great to see you. The book is The Second Amendment, a biography. It's out now. For my viewers out there, I want to hear from you. Join the conversation on my Facebook page. Share your thoughts on Twitter by tweeting at King's Things and using the politicking hashtag. That's all for this week's Politicking.